actually, what, what's great is she gave a lot of background, and I'm not going to do that. So take all of her background. It's terribly bleak for children. It's not quite as bleak for adults, but you're, you're doing it just like um, she said, you're doing a lot of the treatment in your office. The amount of patients who actually see a psychiatrist is you know, small. So I'm going to talk more just about tools. I'm going to be talking about that risk assessment and what you can do in your office and what kind of tools you should have at hand. Okay. So the, the primary topic is suicidal ideation in primary care. The subtitle, oh crap, that patient answered yes to that quick suicide question. Now my schedule is shot. So again, I'm Kim Nordstrom, and the reason I'm putting my credentials here is um, I'm, I'm trying to show you that this is my bread and butter. This is what I do. Um, I am at the Psych Emergency Services at Denver Health. I love it. You get a sense of me. I you know, get excited about this kind of thing. The two things that I'm expert at is the risk assessment and the agitated patient, because it's all I do every day. So, and I'm part of a national organization, which is what we do all the time. So, um, so here we go. So meet John Doe. Mr. John Doe walks into your clinic. He's 53. In fact, you saw his name on your schedule of 20 plus patients for the day and you were excited because you know it was a quick med refill. And you know John Doe. He's been, you know, working with you for about 10 years. He comes in, comes out. You, you ask the questions you need to ask. You've seen him in, in the community. Just a good guy, upstanding citizen. So he came in for his refills for Lipitor and Lysinopril. Again, nice and easy. Um, as a general screen, you have all patients fill out a PHQ-2. Okay? You, you saw in uh, Charlie's talk, the patient health questionnaire, you saw the longer version than I. How many people use PHQs? Okay, so you guys know what I'm talking about, or at least some of you do. You had to fill out the PHQ-2. And it was shown that he had marked depression and lack of interest. We're going to come back to John in just a minute to talk more about what all that means. So, you, you know, you're a little worried about John because, you know, a five out of six is kind of substantial. You, you go back and forth, oh, man, this is the quick, easy patient. It's the only one of the day. I got a lot of H&Ps and all this complicated stuff for the day. I really want to ask about suicide. No, I don't. No, I don't. You know, the devil, the angel. Yes, you do. No, you don't. Yes, you do. No, you don't. So why ask? Well, studies. There's a million studies on this. You just type it into Google. 20 studies will come up like this. That patients kill themselves after seeing doctors. Okay? So there's studies that show, you know, two weeks later, six weeks later, they do. And it's not just primary care that's on the hook, emergency room specialists even psychiatrists who happens to us, and the reason for their visit usually isn't depression. John came in for a med refill. Ah, to almost quote my good old friend Shakespeare, to screen or not to screen, that is the question. So why do we screen? The pros. Okay. Well, you're going to better understand your patient, right? You're going to understand this person more com comprehensively. Um, in asking the questions, you can't help but build rapport because you're asking deeper things. Uh, you, you know, you're asking, how are you, not, how's that Lipitor treating you? You know, you're asking something deeper, so it builds rapport. Okay, so that's a, that's a pro. Um, you may catch an ongoing issue. That depressed patient may be the reason the hypertension's out of control is the depressed patient's having trouble taking the med regularly, doing the exercise you suggested, taking certain things out of their diet. So catching an ongoing issue can also help other chronic issues that are going on. You might catch an emergency. You might save a life from suicide because you asked the question. And I can't say for sure, but you might sleep better at night for asking. Okay, we can all at least hope. The cons against screening. Well, it takes time to screen. Any extra question you ask is a little bit more time, right? You may catch an ongoing issue. <laughs> now I gotta do something about it, you know, and then what then? And you know, do I bring other people in? Do I not? What does that mean? And then you might catch an emergency, oh crap, what the heck? You know, um, I went from 
John being my easy patient to now I'm having to skip lunch and I'm going to have a bunch of patients after lunch mad at me because it's 30 minutes late. They don't know I just skipped lunch trying to help them out. I have a lot of friends who are primary care docs, so I, I, I've heard the stories. So uh, the PHQ-2, there's two questions, hence PHQ-2. <laughs> um, so one is talking about anhedonia. It's over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? So little interest or pleasure in things, and so it's a, a like like Likert scale. And then feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. So you have the anhedonia side and you have the depressed side. Well, the score interpretation is is quite useful. Basically, so say we just, you know, hits a three, just right there in the middle. They have a 75% chance of having some type of depressive disorder. Yeah, it might not be major depression, but who cares? You're, you're catching a depressive disorder. So John Doe, we're back to him. So he had that score of five, so he had a 56.4% likelihood of MDD and an 84.6 likelihood of a depressive disorder. So you've caught something just by asking two questions. Is that enough information to determine treatment? No, of course not. So this is when you might consider verbally asking him um, the questions of the PHQ-9. And um, for those who don't use the, the longer form, the PHQ-9 in your, uh, in your setting, uh, the PHQ-9 basically goes after most of those questions associated with depression. So energy, um, appetite, sleep, that kind of thing. Okay, this is what the PHQ-9 looks like. It's used differently at, at different clinics. Some of my friends have just all new patients use it. Well, that new patient 10 years later is not a new patient, but may have depression. So you might want to consider, if you don't do it at every visit, that you do it periodically. Um, another friend of mine uses it on all patients who are on an antidepressant because then there's a subjective report at every visit in terms of how the patient is doing. And if it's static, treatment's probably not working all that well. And if it's getting worse, then you're really having to think about, you know, what needs to change in this treatment. And this is totally on the web. So this is really easy to get to if you don't already have it. So this whole PHQ thing looks real easy, but there's a question nine. Actually, a few of my friends, we have very candid conversations, um, usually over a glass or two of wine, and they tell me, a lot of times I will do the PHQ verbally because I don't want to touch question nine. I don't want to touch it. Because if I ask question nine and it's positive, what the heck am I supposed to do? And they don't say the word heck. And a lot of people get very scared by that question nine. Thoughts you would be better off dead or thoughts of hurting yourself in some way. The heck do you do with that? Does that mean the person's suicidal? No, it doesn't. And in fact, I'm not going to go into this because I'm being mindful of time. Uh, but I'm going to just tell you quickly. Um, there's a research a research group of mine over at Denver Health. Actually, I'm not the primary uh, lead on this. It's uh, Rob Keeley. Some of you might know him, family practitioner, great guy. And um, he's looking at a, a depressed population using a particular intervention. And so the uh, two psychiatrists in the research group, Michael Allen over at University of Colorado and I, we asked to add the CSSRS, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, because they wanted to look at the PHQ-9. Psychiatrists don't use a PHQ-9. So we wanted to kind of look at the two measures. One is going to talk about, uh, we'll get enough data to understand lifetime risk. The other is talking about in the moment, what's happening with the patient. And what we found are those most at risk didn't ha it didn't really correlate with question nine at all. It correlated most with anxiety and psychomotor changes, and our understanding of the psychomotor changes was psychomotor agitation. So it's the person feeling anxious up here or physically acting out their anxiety who is more at risk for suicide. And that, that's backed up in the literature. Back to John. So on closer discussion, John confesses that he wishes that he was no longer alive. He's had a hard time of it lately. He uh, recently lost his job. He's the primary breadwinner for the family, so there's a lot of financial issues. He feels like a failure. 911, right? Admit to psych. No, no. In fact, that can be so detrimental. 
because we don't know that he's actually actively suicidal. We know that he's feeling awful. And we've already started learning tonight that there's a lot of other things you can do before you go there. So let's talk about the down and dirty risk assessment. Um, Charlie, I think, did a really good job. She got into some of the specifics of it. Uh, this, has anyone seen this, the safety? All right, a couple of you, good. Uh, SAMHSA actually supported this in, in the grants, and you can get this, uh, Google it, you can get it for free, you get these pocket cards, they'll send you enough for your whole office so that everybody has this. This walks you through the risk assessment. And what I like, you might have seen on my credentials, it was MD comma JD. Means, uh, you know, the law school thing. Number five is document, okay? We're terrible at documenting, aren't we? We, we ask all these wonderful questions, we don't write it, so then it didn't happen. So this reminds you of the things that are important to that risk assessment. So as Charlie was saying, identifying those risk factors, the protective factors, doing a, a true suicide inquiry, um, and then determining risk, you know, stratifying, determining interventions, and then again, everybody say it out loud. I love it, I love it. All right, so the key factors, the inquiry, looking at risk factors, again, there's static risk factors, and then there's dynamic and then protective factors. Knowing that Charlie went into this, I'm gonna just quickly go through this. So suicide inquiry, you see, I can't help myself. I am I'm really this annoying, even to my friends. Document, 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 I'll leave that now. Uh, be specific, if the patient says, I'll shoot myself, oh, do you have a gun? Like, ask that next question, don't just stay there. Um, is it easy for you to get a gun? Have you been thinking about this? Um, understand the patient's past. Not all acts of self-harm are suicidal acts, but some acts that don't look suicidal could have been suicidal. So it's what was the patient's intent up here. Um, so sometimes the younger patients or those with developmental delay don't realize that five Tylenol probably not gonna kill you, but if they thought it was going to kill them, it was a suicide attempt. Risk factors. So the static ones and the dynamic ones. I can't do anything about John Doe being 53. No, can't do it at all. So he's at risk, right? So globally he's at risk, but it doesn't really help John that I know he's at some risk because he's a white male at the age of 50. So it doesn't really tell me much about him. I care about those modifiable risk factors, things that I can do something about. How can you mitigate the risk? So. In my ER setting, I have a little bit more time to do some of these things. Intoxication, I can give a person time to sober. A family dynamic issue, family meeting. Overwhelm, help problem solve. If you don't have a clinician in your office who can, you know, where you do a nice handoff, so you just did the PHQ-9, you learned enough that got you stressed out that made you say, I can't just leave, let John leave here. Now I'm handing them off over here to my friend, a social worker who happens to be in my office. If you don't have that luxury, you just heard what you need to do. You call Metro Crisis because they're able to do a lot of that. They're able to talk things through. We uh, tell patients all the time when they're being discharged from our ER, we give them their number. Right? They're an awesome resource. You can pay <laughs> Protective factors. Okay, don't just check off a list of things. Uh, believing in God, not a protective factor. Being a Christian, not a protective factor. You, we used to believe that, almost like we used to believe that asking somebody if they're gonna be suicidal will make them suicidal. It's their belief system that can make it a protective factor or not. So many Catholics believe that if they commit suicide, they will go to purgatory or hell. I read a nice study about um, Baptists. Well, they got a very different God who's all forgiving, who believes in grace. And so those that were studied actually thought that they would go to heaven, that God would understand why they committed suicide. So it really doesn't matter what God is up there. It matters what the patient believes. So if they believe that God's going to welcome them, they're so miserable and they think they, they're heaven bound, not a protective factor. Okay, so it's understanding it. It's not having children or caring about your pets. It's the responsibility to them that is a protective factor. So it's, if I'm gone, 
how are they going to make it? That's the protective factor. So again, it can't just be a checklist. You have to understand how the patient thinks about these things. If the patient engages in treatment, believes that it's helpful, and believes that other people care about it, that can be protected. Having a really good support system. That death would cause pain to others is sometimes protective. Have you ever seen the patient who wants to cause pain to others with their suicide? Yeah, I've seen a couple of those. Yeah. So it's not always protective. The point is, understand the protective factors, engage around them, and bring in all natural supports. So going from the risk assessment to the intervention, again, I like the safety. I think it's great. I really strongly suggest you have it in your office. I think they even have a, like a wall chart as well as the pocket cards. They'll help stratify, high, moderate, low. They'll also give you ideas on interventions. They're going to remind you to not only look at risk factors, but to also look at protective factors. They're going to remind you to actually understand the whole picture for suicidality. So way before you even think about asking that first, question if, that first patient if they're depressed, I want you to consider a few things. What do you have? What do you have in your office? Do you even have handouts and information on depression and treatments? Do you know the phone number for suicide hotlines and uh, support lines? Does anyone know the phone numbers for a support line? I would hope so, yeah. <laughs> you have that now. So if you didn't have it before, you got a new resource tonight. Um, do you have a social worker or therapist in your office to aid and hand off? Do you have a friend? who's a therapist, psychologist, um, psychiatrist, that you can curbside, it's always good to have friends, okay? So if you don't have a friend yet, hurry up and make a friend. Go to a social. Uh, you know, hurry up and make a friend so you can do those curbsides. And do you have mental health holds in your office? Because a lot of times you can talk the patient off the ledge. You can bring in supports that will help you do that. But sometimes you can't. And so you have to have that one vehicle that will ensure safety, and that is the ability to get them into treatment against their will. Okay, so when do you actually place a mental health hold and call 911? If a patient clearly says, I'm suicidal and has clear intent, that's an easy one, right? If the patient says they're suicidal, and then they're getting ambivalent around the intent. It sounded very strong and sure, and then as you went on talking, it, the patient got a little wobbly. A lot of times it gets wobbly because they're having a sense now that you're gonna do something, okay? So if you're picking up on that ambivalence, there's nothing wrong with getting them to a higher level of care, a safe place for someone to do that you know, higher level risk assessment, okay? To have more time to do a more thorough evaluation. And then for the kiddos, oh my gosh. If the patient is clear about wanting to commit suicide and the parents are at all minimizing or seem at all ambivalent, take them out of the equation, put them on a mental health. All right, last slide. You called 911, what next? Well, if you've gone through all that trouble, then I think it's very important that you do something to hand off the patient. Because a lot of times the patient will show up from their primary care doc's office Come to my ER, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm sitting there waiting, excited to see the patient, and the only handoff I get is the mental health hold saying, patient suicidal. Wow, so helpful, yeah, thank you. Um, truly, you know, a quick phone call or a progress note makes all the difference in the world. I'll tell you, if I'm, if I'm kind of like questioning what I wanna do with the patient, you know, where I, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I don't see imminence here. I'll probably send them home, you know, I'll get some supports. But, I, you know, if that PCP had given me a call, remember, I don't know the patient. I've got to know the patient for a very short amount of time. You guys have real history. You guys know these people. You give me that information, you tell me what you're really concerned about, I'm a heck of a lot more likely to admit. And then I'm also much more likely to call you later, either you know, leave a message on your voicemail or whatever, tell you what I did with the patient, and uh, you know, so that there's a handoff back.